Hello, everyone. I'm Professor Plank. I respond to various theological and ideological questions and claims from a rationalistic and naturalistic approach in an effort to give and explain the opposite viewpoint and help to balance the conversation. If you like what you see in this video and would like to help out the channel, make sure to subscribe, click the bell so you'll always be notified when new content comes out, and of course, like this video, maybe pop in a comment. All that goes a long way towards pleasing the only omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent force that can actually be proven to exist, the YouTube algorithm, and keeping my channel motoring along. Now on to today's video. Today we're hearing from Father Casey Cole of the YouTube channel Breaking the Habit. Father Casey is a bit different from my usual fare that I respond to in that, aside from occasionally coming across as condescending when addressing non-believers, Father Casey actually seems to be a bit of a nice guy. He seems to be honest and genuine in his apologetics, which doesn't seem to be all that common. In my time of doing counter-apologetics, most of the speakers I encounter come off as intellectually dishonest, bad faith interlocutors, pushing their religious positions like modern day snake oil salesmen, knowing that their magic elixir is pure BS, but this is how they make their living. Or, if they are true believers in what they spin, it comes across as desperate attempts to rationalize and validate their faith that they've just put so much stock into that they are deep down terrified that they might be wrong. And that causes them to become highly antagonistic towards anyone who even suggests that their theistic standpoints might not be accurate. But that doesn't seem to be how Father Casey approaches his apologetics. He seems a true believer who's actually resolute and comfortable in his faith, and seems like he's truly just trying to spread what he views as the good word. But of course, that doesn't make anything that he says actually correct, nor does it absolve him of the condescending hubris that many of his sermons can often fall into. Now today, Father Casey's going to be expressing to us some reasons why one should believe in God. So let's dive in, see what he has to say, to convince us his ethereal BFF is really for real. So take it away, Casey. The idea of there being a powerful cosmic being responsible for creating and controlling the universe used to be commonplace. For the vast majority of human history, those who denied supernatural forces would have been in the extreme minority, and so articulating why we believe in one was often unnecessary. That is not the case today. This is true. In the early days of our species' existence, we were incredibly ignorant of the way that the world around us worked. Yet, we were saddled with a deep-seated need to explain virtually everything. And this is basic human psychology. What we don't understand, we tend to fear. Fear is a negative state to exist in, so we have a natural desire to comprehend the how and the why of virtually everything in order to minimize that fear of it. Why does fire burn? How does the body heal from injury? Where does the sun go at night? Why does it get cold at certain times of the year and hot at others? How come people get sick? What happens when we die? Millions and millions of similar questions about every single tiny aspect of our lives and the world we live in. And if we have no answers to these kinds of questions, then that is just one more thing to be fearful of. If we don't know what the sun is or where it goes at night, then we have no reason to rely on it rising again tomorrow. If we don't understand what fire is and why it burns, we have no reliable reason to think we won't spontaneously burst into flames while sitting on the crapper. Without a general understanding of things, we would exist in a constant state of fear and anxiety about everything around every second of every day. Now, the problem is that we don't actually need to have correct answers to these questions to reduce that anxiety. We just need to believe we have the correct ones. And so, even when people lacked the science and technology to answer many of these questions about the world, they still came up with fanciful answers. Because some kind of answers, unsubstantiated and based on fear and superstition as they may be, are better than no answers at all to most people. So how come people get sick? Curses, hexes, or bad air. Where does the sun go at night? Well, the sun is just Helios riding his chariot across the sky, so he's put his chariot away for the night, obviously. Why does fire burn? Because it's a magical substance that Prometheus stole from the gods to give to humanity. What happens when we die? 
An ethereal, incorporeal version of ourselves leaves our body undetectably and floats off to an eternal paradise, which is directed and controlled, as all things are, by a benevolent, all-powerful father figure. So fear not, dear believer, because you have the answers to these questions, and all questions. There's no need to fear. There's no reason for the anxiety of not knowing. Because you have the ultimate answer to every question, every why that could ever be asked. Because that's the way God wants it. And there's the rub. If we can recognize that answers like Prometheus giving us fire, or Helios' chariot, or sickness hexes, were just silly rationalizations to alleviate fear about things we didn't fully understand, then why can't we acknowledge the same when it comes to the catch-all, warm and fuzzy answer to every question that is, Yahweh did it? Because that's the way Yahweh wants it. The fact that everyone used to believe in God or gods for what literally everyone can acknowledge now were silly superstition reasons and fear of the unknown is a major obstacle to modern-day theistic belief which really just seems to be the modern equivalent of that ancient fear-reducing superstition. Why is it okay for you to believe in unproven and unprovable magic when similar positions of the past are dismissed as the silliness of the ignorant? As atheism continues to grow, people of faith are all of a sudden having to defend their own existence. Is this not just superstition? Has science not debunked the naivete of our ancient forefathers? Untrained in this sort of debate, some Christians attempt to frame their answer in the atheist language. They try to prove mathematically, prove empirically, that there must be a God. Using logic, pointing to the unexplained, presenting what they believe to be forensic evidence of God's past deeds, they engage the question as if it were a question of science. But this is simply not the case. Yes, it absolutely is. Everything is science. Everything that exists is explorable through science. Casey, what do you think science is? Because it seems as though you think that anything that is not currently detectable with our current level of modern technology isn't scientific. Or if we have a mathematic equation that we cannot solve, or our current math cannot accurately measure something, then it isn't scientific. A thousand years ago, they couldn't see viruses because they didn't have microscopes. So germs and viruses weren't scientific at the time. You just seem to think of science as what we can explain in the here and now. But that isn't it. Science is rational and reasonable knowledge obtained through observation and or experimentation. Even though they couldn't see viruses a thousand years ago, viruses still existed, and that was something that was scientifically detectable, even though we didn't have the technology to do it yet. The scientific method is applicable to literally everything. If psychic visions sent by a deity are real, then that is something that is scientifically knowable. There would have to exist some mechanism by which that vision could be transmitted from such a being into the minds of a human. And even if we can't detect and measure that mechanism today, that doesn't mean we couldn't devise some way to do so tomorrow. The same is true with any supposed miracles. The same is true with the idea of a spiritual afterlife, souls, or heaven or hell. If it exists, it is knowable. If it is knowable, it is scientific. Because that's what science is. It's acquired knowledge. So to say that matters of religion, spirituality, and God are beyond the possibility of scientific explanation is little more than an attempt to wipe away the expectation of religion being rational or logical or require any kind of proof. And with such notions of provability off the table, you can insist that religion should just be believed purely through faith. Believe it because you feel it, because you want it to be true. Or basically, believe it because I, a spiritual authority who speaks on behalf of the Holy Church, am telling you it's real. No proof required, just faith. Faith in God, faith in the Word, faith in me, and what I'm insisting to you is true. Those are really bad reasons to believe in anything. That was exactly the mentality of all those fools who believed in curses making people sick. 
until we scientifically proved that that was nonsense. Our belief in God is not a matter of fact, not a result of verifiable sense data. It's the result of faith. To look for fingerprints or mathematical proofs is to look for God in the wrong places. It's an attempt to replace faith with certainty. See what I mean? Faith is just accepting something as true in absence of evidence just because you want to. Is there any position that one could not accept through faith? Every cult leader who thought they themselves were God, didn't they accept that self-aggrandizing belief through faith? And didn't their followers do the same? Every holy war and accompanying genocide, didn't they believe through faith that God wanted them to slaughter their rivals and wipe them from existence? Didn't every brutal dictator of the ancient world, and many more in modern times, believe through faith that they were anointed by God or gods to rule over others, and that whatever atrocities they enacted against others were justified because their rule was divinely ordained? At what point do you admit that faith is a fallible metric and is in no way a reliable path to truth? Have faith, brothers and sisters. I would not make you see what you have seen. I would not ask you to choose what you may choose without first showing you God's messenger. The only fact of the matter, what must guide our inquiry into this question, is that we don't know for certain that there's a God. We don't. At least not in the same way that we know that 2 plus 2 is 4, that gravity is a force that brings bodies of matter together. If God were an observable fact, then there would be no choice to believe, no room for free love, no faith. I don't know how you got that there was no room for free love if God were observable. You can't love something you know to exist. I guess you don't love your parents then? And as for there being no room or need for faith if God were observable, well... Captain, that is the point. Faith is meaningless and unnecessary when you have valid, substantive reasons to believe in something. So you seem to be arguing for faith for faith's sake. We can't have knowledge of God because we wouldn't need faith. Well, yeah, exactly. And since faith is a bad path to truth, we should want to be rid of it in favor of what is actually a good path to truth, like the scientific method, or logic, rational argumentation, provable lines of evidence. This is how you get to truth, not through faith, not believing something because you want it to be true, or because you were indoctrinated into it from birth, or because you can't wrap your mind around it not being true, i.e. personal incredulity. You know, all the main ways people come to faith in religion. God is not a fact. I'm going to say that better myself. But that doesn't mean that God can't be known to those who have been given the gift of faith. For those who believe, evidence abounds. For one, we're privileged with innumerable accounts of those who have witnessed God with their own eyes. Our scriptures testify that for more than a millennia, God spoke to his people through angels, powerful plagues, and direct commands. Witnesses saw the living and true God of Jesus Christ heal the sick and raise the dead. A fraud does not have the immediate success that he had. A fake does not transform an entire region of the world overnight. Hearsay? That is your first good reason to believe in God? You know, there is a reason why secondhand accounts of what people claim to have supposedly witnessed are not allowed in legal proceedings, don't you? And I know we aren't talking about a courtroom here, but we are talking about evaluating evidence for validity and soundness, so a lot of the same reasoning applies as does in a courtroom. When talking about hearsay, or claims about what someone supposedly witnessed, there are a lot of problems. The actual witness is not making the claim, but instead a claim is being made by others on the supposed witness's behalf. Who was it who witnessed the resurrection of Jesus? Who are the witnesses to that? Can you name them? Can you name any of them except for Paul, the hearsay accounter who claimed this to be true? And let's not even get into whether or not Paul is worthy of being considered a credible source. 
But wait, we don't even have any confirmed account by Paul himself. What we actually have is the Bible claiming that it is giving us Paul's account. But it's highly disputed that any of the New Testament was even written by those it's attributed to. So we don't even have a verifiable hearsay account. We have a second-hand account of a second-hand account of a second-hand account. And the same is true of literally everything that the Bible claims about Jesus' supposed miracles. How do you know he walked on water? Why, because it says so in the Bible? Well... And how do you know Jesus healed the sick, turned water into wine, or multiplied fishes and loaves in order to feed scores of people, or any of the other miracles that are attributed to him? Because it says so in the Bible? Well... And I don't make that point facetiously just because I'm an atheist and don't want to accept the Bible. I make it because the Bible is not a reliable source. It is not a historical text. It's a religious one. New Testament or Old, nothing in it, as far as its relaying of events, is credible by even the lowest of epistemological standards. That bar is so low, it's practically on the floor. And as far as the idea that Jesus changed the faith of an entire region of the world overnight, well, no, he didn't do that. He was a faith leader for years, gaining followers rather slowly. I mean, he was in his 30s when he died, but despite angels supposedly telling the three wise men to bring him gifts when he was born, and all of the signs that signified the coming of the Son of God, J.C. didn't even develop any kind of following to speak of until he was an adult. And even when he did start his ministry, it didn't exactly transform everything because it didn't stop the Romans from not believing in him to the point of crucifying him, nor the Jewish orthodoxy, the major religion the majority of people followed at the time, from requesting that crucifixion. Even after his death and his supposed resurrection, witnessed by supposedly hundreds who saw and knew that this man had risen from the dead, it was still another decade before Christianity proper actually got off the ground. That's a relatively slow start for someone who supposedly performs such amazing and undeniable miracles. It's not even close to being considered overnight. For the more philosophically minded, we find reason to believe because we cannot imagine an infinite regress of time and space. Nor do you have to. God not existing would not necessitate such an infinite regress. Where did it all come from? We can say that humans adapted from primitive monkeys that evolved from primitive mammals that go back to some primitive goo that ultimately go back to the Big Bang. But what caused the Big Bang? Where did these atoms come from? Who created them? No one created them. Why does it have to be a someone? Why does any of it even need to have come into existence in the first place? This is one of the weirdest arguments for God that seems so pervasive. The argument for God here is that God created everything, but that God himself did not have to be created. That God exists as just a brute fact of existence. But then, if you say, well, why couldn't the universe just exist without needing to be created? That the hot, dense state that precipitated the Big Bang and provided all the energy that would eventually become all the matter and atoms of the universe it existed as a brute fact of existence that didn't need to be created. And then the theistic retort is that that's just ridiculous. Nothing can exist eternally without needing to be caused. Well, what about God? Well, God doesn't have to be caused because he's God. He is the cause. Well, why can't the universe itself, or more specifically the energy that became the whole universe, why couldn't it just be the cause? Why couldn't it exist without having to be caused? Because it just couldn't. It, it, it just couldn't. This is not a valid argument. It's just an argument from incredulity fallacy. You're just concluding that because you can't or refuse to believe something, it must not be true, improbable, or the argument must be flawed. The simpler explanation is that the universal energy that fueled the Big Bang and became all space and matter exists uncaused, rather than an intelligent, willful, ethereal, incorporeal, omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent entity 
exists uncaused, and then used magical powers to create everything out of nothing, something theists regularly say is impossible, and then they chastise atheists for believing in such a thing when it comes to the Big Bang, even though Big Bang cosmology doesn't posit something from nothing. It's just a ludicrous line of theistic reasoning that holds less water than a gremlin drinking beakers of chemicals in a science lab. <laughs> to go back and back and back to infinity just doesn't make sense. There must be a first cause, a first mover of history that is outside of time and space. There must be a reason why there is something rather than nothing. For many, the illogical nature of purely material existence is enough to believe. Why would you even think that nothing was ever even a possibility? Nothing is a concept, not a reality. There's no such thing as nothing, as in utter non-existence. Because if nothing existed, it would exist and therefore be something, not nothing. What makes you think such a thing is even possible? And again, if you are willing to affirm that God must have always existed uncaused, why can't you affirm that the universal energy always existed uncaused? There just is no reason to insist on a first cause or prime mover, and insisting on it in the form of a magical triomni being beyond personal incredulity and a desire for God to be real. This is fanciful, wishful thinking masquerading as logical deduction. Others begin with the human experience, the intimate knowledge of self. Within our being is a desire to know. Our nature is disposed to discovery, self-reflection, and identity, inexhaustible desires within us that reach forward infinitely. With everything we learn, everything we answer, we are left with 10 more questions, leaving us to conclude that we are not beings that will ever be satisfied with something, but rather seeking out infinity itself, God. So then, because we are curious, therefore God. I mean, I really want to steel man your argument here, but I just don't see how you hop, skipped, and jumped from what is so obviously an evolutionary adaptation that's relatively common in most biological life forms in the Animalia Kingdom, right to a creator god being. Our desire to know is something that, well, frankly, I already went over earlier in this video. The entire reason we developed religion in the first place was because of our innate desire to reduce fear and uncertainty by gaining knowledge of the world around us. So I would say that you have the causality there completely backwards. God didn't create human curiosity. Human curiosity created our belief in God. And a similar need to learn and understand is not a uniquely human trait. Why do you think that any animal that hears a sudden loud noise will instantly look in that direction? I mean, what is that but curiosity as to what caused the noise and an innate desire to see and therefore learn of the noise's cause? Or why virtually any animal will investigate something unfamiliar coming into its territory? Why is it when nature documentarians set up a camera in virtually any location, it won't be long before some various animals come along and give the camera a complete examination? What is any of this but curiosity? Sure, we humans may do it a bit more thoroughly and have a more in-depth exploration of things, which we're able to do because of our greater degree of cognitive complexity, but the basic drive of curiosity is the same for practically all animals. We aren't special in that regard. But even if we were, even if humans were the only creatures on this planet that sought to learn and increase our knowledge and understanding of the world around us, I fail to see how that would point to any kind of a creator god being being behind it. It would just be a trait that benefits us and thus an evolutionary adaptation that we came to through natural selection that we would be the singular creature with such an adaptation does not point to it being divinely inspired. That would only mean that all other creatures took different evolutionary paths that were successful without a curiosity factor. But again, all animals have that to some degree, so we aren't special as far as curiosity is concerned. But of course, there is a final way to know. It is the purest and most simple of explanations. 
there are some of us that have personally encountered God. Maybe we've witnessed a miracle or heard his voice speak within us. Maybe we felt undeniable comfort in the midst of tragedy, had a life-changing experience with no other explanation than God's loving hand. This is why I believe, truly, trusting in others, seeking God in philosophy and anthropology makes sense and give greater meaning to what I know. But when it comes down to it, the reason I believe is because I have felt his healing presence in my life. Not to belittle your or other people's experiences. Truly, that isn't my goal here. But I do need to make a point. People have claimed to have been abducted by aliens, and they genuinely believe that they have. But most would agree that they hallucinated their experiences. They dreamed it, or imagined it, or got wasted, watched a sci-fi movie, and just latched onto it in their drug-addled state until they thought it had happened to them. And they're convinced that it was real. Same with people who claim to have seen ghosts. Same with people who believe they encountered Bigfoot. Same with people who believe that they've had psychic visions, premonitions of the future, past life regression, and a whole host of other supernatural accounts that, at least some of, I think you would affirm likely didn't happen, but were in fact concoctions of the person's mind. Because you don't believe in the specific supernatural thing that they're claiming, and you see no reason why you should believe their accounts when the simpler explanation is that, basically, they're wrong in their accounts. Not necessarily that they're lying or manipulating, it's quite possible and likely that they truly believe what they're claiming. But that doesn't mean that any of it actually happened. Well, if that can be the case with aliens, ghosts, ghouls, goblins, visions, and all manner of other supernatural claims, why can't it be true for religious ones? I mean, I would imagine that even among people's claims of religious experiences, some you would conclude aren't true. I found out I'm the devil! The end of the world is coming. It's near. The angel showed me. We don't fear these demons. We destroy them. And you can't escape God's wrath! It's a common thing among formerly religious atheists that many of us believed at one time that we had felt the presence of God, that we had the same kinds of experiences you are talking about having yourself, and we believed at the time that it was true. But after deconverting and deconstructing our religious beliefs, we came to the conclusion that our supposed experiences of God were nothing more than self-deception. We thought we had felt the presence of God because we wanted to feel the presence of God. And of course, this entire line of reasoning is nothing more than anecdotal accounts, which are not even viable means of convincing anyone else of anything. Only the person who experienced it can be convinced through anecdotal accounts. So then, what is the rationale behind a God who directly speaks to or interacts with some people, but not others? And then those he didn't make his presence clearly known to through that direct contact, such as he supposedly had with you, he punishes anybody he doesn't speak to by eternal damnation. And if there was a just and loving God, he wouldn't allow this kind of crap to go down. So those were Father Casey's best reasons to believe in God. That, for starters, it's silly to try to prove God rationally, but as for good reasons to believe, hearsay accounts loosely cataloged in the Bible, personal incredulity that anything could exist uncaused, and so the universe must require an uncaused thing to create it, humans are curious, therefore God, and I think I felt God touching me. Could you show me on the doll where he touched you? And yes, I'm being a bit dismissive. That's because these are some weak sauce reasons to believe in God. Frankly, this all amounts to post hoc rationalizations for the already believing. These are the kinds of things you say to a theist who already affirms the existence of God and is just looking to solidify more strongly that stance. And since people who are already primed to believe something need very little convincing, the obvious flaws in these lines of reasoning will be largely ignored by fellow Christians. This all sounds good on first glance, so it must be sound reasoning. Well, no. If your rationalizations can't hold up to the lightest scrutiny, as these arguments certainly can't, 
then you might want to go back to the drawing board and try to come up with some better reasons to believe. But then, of course, that's where Casey's last reason to believe comes into play. The personal experience. Because even if every other argument for the existence of God is knocked down, you can always run back to the cover of, I know God is real because I saw him, heard him, felt him. I don't know, smelled and tasted him too. And that may not convince anyone else, but it's good enough for me. Well, frankly, that's argumentatively a bit like saying you're taking your ball and going home. If you can't defend your position rationally, just justify it irrationally with a personal anecdote and be done with it. Well, as Hitchens said, what can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. And your whole opening point was that looking for evidence of God was silly. So guess what? We can dismiss the idea of God just as easily. So that is where we'll leave things for today. So thanks for watching, everyone. Don't forget to like this video, comment, and subscribe, so you'll always be notified when a new video comes out. Till next time, I'm Professor Plink reminding you to keep striving for greater understanding. It's the best way to get wherever you want to go.